Welcome to Spirits Podcast, episode 40, Lauma. Not hey. Lambda, which is a very cool mathematical symbol, okay. but Lauma. Amanda was also saying Lama a couple times before we actually started recording, so. Listen, like I said last time, I don't bring the pronunciation, I bring no, the goofs. you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, though. So, Amanda, um, what should we talk about first? Should we talk about our amazing patrons, maybe? Mm, always such a good way to start a day. So, I would love to welcome our newest patrons, Eve, Kristen, Hannah, David, Brandon, Erica, Lauren, and both Alex S's. You guys must be twins or something because you're different people, but you're both here. Uh, thank you all so, so much for joining us. Yes, and Amanda, I think we should also thank our amazing knitting masterpieces of the rainbow supporting patrons. I'm going to switch up the order this time. Are okay. you ready, y'all? Do that. Dylan, Julia, Deborah, Katie, Sarah, Megan, MCF, Christina, Catherine, Phil, Shannon, and Leanne, thank you so much for being our supporting producer-level patrons. Yes, rock. We love you so, so much. That was real good. And Jules, what actually were we drinking during this episode? So we're not going to get into it right away, but the Lauma are... There, it's wine moms. We drank a yeah, lot of wine because we did. Lo- wine moms is basically what. Uh, yeah, the we story talked about is. wine moms, and I, I am sort of embracing the identity into which you may slide one day. I think I'm going to be more of a martini spinster aunt. That's fine. I'm a wine. Yeah, mom. yeah. But it's, between the two of us, we we got this covered. Yeah, I'm, I'm a sweet vodka aunt. I think right now I'm a sweet vodka aunt. You are, and then I will get into that wine mom territory <laughs> in about twenty years. We were on the beach a couple weeks ago, and we saw these amazing wine moms carrying around these gigantic plastic, like, Tervis Tumbler-style wine glasses that floated. They yes. floated. And it was also, the perfect beach. And also, you could, like, stick them, like, they had a stem but no but no base. So oh, you could shit, stick them into the that. sand, Julia. Oh, that my was God. the point. They're so good. They're so good. Different colors. Of them. Super cute. Everyone on the beach sort of flocked toward them and were like, where'd you get this? And uh, I, I'm not going to lie. I kind of want one. I need 20 of them immediately, especially since our last beach trip uh like three different beers were lost to the ocean yeah we may or may not have been illegally drinking beer in the ocean but i what i found is that if you have a can or a bottle of beer either one doesn't matter when you have to like dive under a wave to not get hit you can just put your thumb over the hole of yeah. the can or the bottle and then no seawater gets in or you could do what our friend eric did and just drink a goza so that when seawater gets in as it inevitably will doesn't really change the flavor i mean he did immediately lose an entire beer, and his sunglasses to a wave. Listen, let's not put the boy on blast. <laughs> Moving on. When you are out on the beach this summer or winter, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, sorry, um, you can be rocking a kind of creepy, kind of cool t-shirt and water spirit pins. Yes, guys, uh, there is only one day left in our pre-order. So you need to, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, like we hope you are, there is only one day left and you need to get your orders in if you want your kind of creepy, kind of cool or your pin set. We are very hopeful that these will also be available after the pre-order window is done, but we're not sure exactly when. So if you want them shipped to you first, if you want to be in the first batch of people and maybe get a little surprise in your package, may or may not be uh, guaranteeing that, but DFTV is great and we're trying to line something up for you, um, you can pre-order our merch at spiritspodcast.com slash merch. Do it up. You know you want to be that trendsetter wearing the kind of creepy, kind of cool shirt. Oh, I'm so excited to get mine. Uh, dude, I'm ready to rock those pins. Amazing. And that is our recommendation corner is just to uh, buy some merch. Yeah. Thanks. We love you. Uh, so without further ado, enjoy Spirits Podcast episode 40, Lauma. Okay, Amanda, so we're going to jump right into it this week. I'm sorry, are you sure you have no more criticisms of my dating life? No, I'm good. Okay. I'm I'm solid. Are you sure? Yes. This is the opportunity to say it. I think we're okay. Okay, good. All right, sweet. Um, So this week, I want to talk about compassion and identity uh, because the group of goddesses that we're going to be talking about this week are known in Latvian and Lithuanian mythologies as some of the oldest goddesses there are. Those are two very good subjects that are very ancient that we probably should be talking about some good. For sure. And I want to talk about compassion, both compassion uh, that we can feel for others and also how we extend it without being taken advantage of. For sure. Which you'll understand why when we kind of get through this story. But first things first, let's dive into the story of the Laume. Okay. Um, so let me just clarify something real quick because I'm going to be switching back and forth. Uh, Laume is the word for the group of goddesses as a whole, and a single goddess, um, as she kind of appears in certain stories, is known as a Lauma. Sort of Morgan style. Yes. Nice. Okay. So this is a group of goddesses. Um, we're talking like 
they're so old, Amanda, they date back to the Ice Age. Wow. Like, it's right after the Ice Age. It's early Mesolithic for the nerds in the crowd. That primordial stuff. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so Laume would appear in drawings to start with as she goats, bears, brown dogs, or mares. I did not mean for that to rhyme. <laughs> uh, you did a great job there. And I mean, that makes total sense, right? Like it's it's the, the commonplace animals. It's yeah. the things that we see every single day. Of course, we're going to start by mythologizing and trying to explain those things that are most familiar to us. Sure. And as they began to be more worshipped um, and more centralized, uh, they began to appear more woman-like but with animal features. So bird claws for feet, women with heads or lower bodies of goats, half dog, half horse were also a common combination, or they would have one eye like a cyclops. So my least favorite thing, which is, which is it's mixing up thing. animal traits, but okay, continue. It only lasts for like 100 years or so. <laughs> so a drop in the bucket, no worries. <laughs> um, so one of the key features that they had early on were stone nipples. Um... Okay, I have I have a reason for it. Okay, continue. Okay, so what was common in the area were these fossils that were known as Bellum natida, and they kind of look like bullets, but they're really this kind of extinct shelled squid or something, and humans uh, would call these fossil fossilized versions of these little baby squids uh, laume nipples. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm with you so far. Another explanation for the fossils, because they were clearly a big deal to the early Lithuanians and the Latvians, was that the Laume once kept huge cows that they would allow people to milk and get sustenance from. Very okay, nice. so like divine source of nutrition and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, however, during a cold winter, all the cows of the Laume died, and the fossils left behind were the remains of their udders. Okay. Okay. We're, we're good. We're, on, we're but... on the nipple page now. We're okay. Julia, I want to leave the nipple page. So what is next? <laughs> we're moving on. So so the Lithuanians considered the Laume during this period to be very dangerous. This is still the half animal period. Yes. Um, Which like correct, because yes. we talked in the past about how um, very frequently the marker of a demon, regardless of the culture that that demon is in, mm -hmm. is a sort of mixing of animal and human in a way that's unexpected or creepy or or just like not natural. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, so the Laume were very dangerous, particularly to men, which is always good. Sign me up for that. What's up? Um, Laume would tickle or tweak people, usually men, to death. Uh, On their nipples or elsewhere? Wherever, I guess. Okay. I mean, like, if we're going to do nipple tweaking, I guess we'll I mean, stay I there. I mean, I hear the word tweak, Julie. I don't know what else to think about. It's <laughs> okay. either heroin or nipples. I don't know. All right. Well, they would tweak or tickle them to death. Not on Let's the nipple. Let's never say that word again. <laughs> I'm so tickle. sorry. Great. Um, and then eat their bodies. Uh, okay. Um, and this is actually where they become very similar to the Lamia uh, in Greek mythology, which we actually discussed in the Valentine's Day Seductress episode. Yeah, we did. Do you remember did. that at all? Yeah. Do you remember anything about the La Lamia? Tell no. Me. No, okay. The Lamia <laughs> was basically a woman who, um, through some means, insulted Hera, and then uh. Hera would turn their, uh, she turned her basically into a monster that would eat children. Got it. We good? We're on yes. the same page now? Yes. Okay, great. Not the nipple page, the next page. No, we're on the, okay. we're on the eating children page okay. now instead. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> Clearly. Just something uncomfortable. Oh, um, oh. So one of the ways of keeping Laume at bay was uh, by keeping iron tools around because they hmm. feared iron. And this is interesting because it ties back to certain stories about the Fae that were unable to touch iron or iron was yeah. poisonous to them. Do you remember the Holly Black books that were about like fairies being poisoned by iron? I sure do. They were really, really good and I super like them. Yes. I recommend them. Yes, they were very, very good. I yeah. think Tithe was the first one, but I could be wrong. Amanda's gonna look. It's Ty the Valiant and Ironside. Yes, that was it. So good. They I really recommend good those. Books. Holly, like get in touch. It's later on that the Laume become depicted as beautiful women uh -huh. uh, who usually appeared either naked or in very fine clothing because, you know, that's how we do women in these stories usually. Yeah, the like long arc of mythology bends towards sexy women draped in it fabric. It does. It really does. The Laume were said Surprise, to it's a selkie. You're going to die. <laughs> Well, Kelpies. Kelpies will kill you. Selkies will just marry you, have your babies, and then leave you. I mean, yeah. social death. I mean, social death. Village. Yeah, your wife just left you and ran into the ocean. That's cool, Yoinks. I guess. So Laume were said to have descended from the sky to the earth. 
Okay. They would live near lakes, abandoned bathhouses, on islands on lakes, or in dense forests. But so, like, there's a water thing happening I was here. just going to say, water is very important. And how did they conceive of the sky? Was it like the, the big ocean to which we all return? Like, what was the tie-in there? Um, I think she actually later on gets associated with a rain god. Huh. And um, with rainbows. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Okay. But uh, yeah, that. I'll shelve my question. Yes. Thank you. Shelve that question. Put it back back on the shelf. Back like burner. A, we got like it. Like a book. Like it's a Holly Black book. It's simmering. Don't worry. <laughs> Holly Black is on my second shelf in my whole library. Well, also because your thing is done alphabetically. Yes. Yes. That's true. That's cool. True. Okay. Um, so Lao Mei, uh, a lot of bodies of water in Lithuania are actually named after a Lauma or give homage to the goddesses. Wow. Laume were said to have gathered near bodies of water on the night of either a new or full moon where they would dance and kind of just throw a rave. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, yeah. Lakeside um, party. Love it. And there would be sort of a fairy ring left over after yeah. these awesome raves, which would be an indication that the Laume were there. Uh, do you know what the equivalent is for our childhood, Julia? No. Uh, so Julia and I lived in a town with three elementary schools and one middle school. The second middle school that there used to be in that town uh, was like a sort of abandoned and like converted into a like adult oh, okay. education center. Uh, and so high schoolers would have parties in the woods behind that old middle school. I think it was a high school. It was a high no, school. Who knows? Um, but anyway, the, the semi-abandoned, semi-converted into like administrative offices school. Uh, and at some point during, I never went to one of these because I wasn't cool enough to be invited. I was going to say I've never been there No, no, either. no, me neither. My siblings went since they were very young, but like <laughs> obviously they're much cooler than I am. Uh, but the the like evidence left behind was like the circle of like natty light cans left yep. in the like forest floor, you know, off the side of the parkway as uh, as kids would run from the cops. Yep. Sounds uh, right. Anyway, Feels right. we lots of <laughs> the modern day Lao Mei are just teenage kids. <laughs> we led a less glamorous life than the Lao Mei did. That's true. So the Lao Mei are said to be the most powerful during the new moon. Yeah, and even more so during the rainiest months in Lithuania. Water makes sense. Yeah, Lao Mei were said to cause hail, storms, or rain by singing, dancing, or through curses because they could do awesome. that. Awesome awesome into it uh in weddings up until the 19th century uh lao mei songs were performed where a group of girls would dance in a circle with one girl usually the bride in the middle wow and this dance and song were said to cause rain and to bring good fortune that's amazing it's like the mix between a flower girl a fairy ring and like a maypole you know kind of into that i am kind of into it too and maybe i missed it but why where is the distinction between one lao ma and multiple lao mei uh, so up until this point, Lao Mei is the group of goddesses or right. spirits. They're kind of in the middle at this point. I'm actually about to get to a story where we're having an individual Lao Ma. Ooh, okay. All right, cool. So later stories in Lithuanian mythology take the Lao Mei and combine them into the one singular atmospheric goddess known as the Lao Ma. Got it. There we go. We good? I did not know you were going there, no, no, but I'm okay. glad I got there. Yeah. That's all right. Um, so she is described as extremely beautiful. Uh, and she lived in the clouds and ruled on a diamond throne. Uh, amazing. I know. I'm so into the aesthetic. I am super into that also. Um, so most stories claimed that she was the bride of the thunder god, uh, Percunus. Sounds like percussion. I'm into that. I, that's actually, that's a good point. I would not have guessed that. Hey. Though whether or not they were actually married depends on the story. Okay. Uh, in some tales, Lauma falls in love with the moon, which is a male god in Lithuania. Uh, Lauma, really? therefore, is said to love moonlight. Okay. Another story actually says that she was stolen before the wedding by a Velnaeus, uh, which is a kind of devil in their mythology hmm. that was named uh, Tuolius. Wow. I mean, it makes sense that I think moonlight and water would go together. The idea of like skinny dipping under yeah. a moon, like it's romantic. It's interesting. I like that a lot. It's also really gorgeous because, you know, the water reflects the moon exactly. and all that. It's very beautiful. Exactly. Um, but let's talk about a story where uh, Lauma actually marries Percunus. Uh, in this story, she is also known as Veva okay. and is associated with rainbows. In Lithuanian, the rainbow literally translates as the ribbon of Veva. Man, I love that. Those little like historical and mythological nuggets buried in language. Like, it is, it's amazing. It's really cool. I yeah. love that so much. There's another one like later on that's really, really good. <laughs> that's exciting. Um, so she is married to Percunus, but she falls in love with a man named Stroblis. Okay. Um, who's a singer. Awkward. 
Yep. So Strobilus is immortal. He is a mortal, not immortal. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Classic. Always got to fall in love with the mortal. It's yeah. like falling in love with the like slacker stoner or the like, you know, student who wants to play guitar and not be on the football team. I mean, obviously. I've been watching Riverdale, guys. It's true. Oh, it's God. True. Really? Yep. Okay. It's great. Right, we'll Y'all, talk about it later, I guess. I, I am not going to lie to you. It is highly entertaining. I think I saw the first two episodes. It was like. And, like, there's a murder, but also a significant subplot is that one of the main characters wants to play guitar and not on the football team. I do know that that's Archie. And I'm like, bruv, you you can do both. You can be the thing that does both. ¿Por qué no los dos? (laughs) Okay. um, So, Straubless gains Veva's attention by stealing the ribbon of Veva. So, he literally steals a rainbow from her. (laughs) Uh, And it's during a rainstorm, so he stretches the ribbon across the sky. Wow. And Perkunas sees his wife's ribbon grows angry and shouts down at the man. Okay. But his shouts become thunder. Oh. And so the Lithuanian shepherds below believe the rainbow has caused the rain and pray to Veva and Perkunas to break up the rainbow and make the rain go away. So I see that they ship the marriage then. They do. They They ship the marriage. The shepherds ship the marriage. That's a hard sentence to say. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to attempt to repeat it because I won't be able to. Uh, um okay so that's the story with strobeless he just okay. he steals it she's kind of like i'm into that but also perkunas comes in and he's like nah uh um, fair enough it could end a lot worse it could like if this was the, if this was the greek myth it'd be like oh uh, you and everyone you love is dead yes oh no well wait for this next one okay. um so another story claims that lauma fell in love with another beautiful young man uh down on earth another mortal okay um i see she's a type they have a son named milanus oh which derives its meaning from the word mili which is to love oh um so lauma would descend from the sky to feed her son from time to time though he remained with his father kind Mm -hmm. of like a hercules situation yep however when the highest god in the lithuanian pantheon finds out about this sacrilegious union and the child that was born from it. Sure. Um, he takes the child and smashes him into the highest place in the sky. Oh, no. Um, and he becomes a constellation. I don't know what constellation hey. it is, but, you know, it's just the typical, like, I'm going to put you up there, and now you're gone. The, the back burner, the top shelf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like it quite a lot. In this story, too, we also get another explanation for the uh, Belmanitida, or whatever, the fossils, the nipples. God, Julia had to bring it up again. Why? <laughs> so the Why? king, the king god, cuts off Lauma's breast as punishment oh. uh, for keeping the relationship hidden, and the stone pieces can be found on the earth. Yikes! Yeah. Why? Why with the nipples, Lithuania? There's just a lot of them around, so they had to give a reason. I mean, for they it. could be finger shaped. No, nope, no, nope. they could be toe nope, shaped. They're nipples, man. That that literally would never come to mind. I will show you a picture of them later, but I nipples, man. I don't know. <sighs> I'm sorry, we said nipples so many times in this Please episode. Please stop. Okay. So because they are often portrayed in very fine clothing and because the story with the ribbon of Veva, yeah. uh, Laume are associated with weaving. Okay. Um, they often appear in groups of three and are skilled in what the resource that I used called the women's skills. Yes, or the women's the, work. The traditionally feminized domestic work of It women, literally yeah. made me cringe. Yeah. Nope. Nope. I know. Okay. Um, but they're just very sewing, good. Sewing, weaving, baking, cooking, cleaning. Well, they're yeah. very good at weaving, spinning, sewing, that, yep. kind, of, that kind of thing. Yep. Anyway, um, they reward people who are industrious. Cool. Um, but they also are known to be uh, looking out for children and helping those in need. For sure. Those Which things I go love. together. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyone who's lazy or ridicules them um, are punished because you don't ridicule God. And just, yeah. You know, don't do that. And you don't ridicule the people who's like, you know, humble, hard work every single day is making the world go around. Yeah. And so those people who are lazy or ridicule the Laume are punished. Um, one would assume it's through the tickling, tweaking method. But again, oh, I said the word again. I'm you, so sorry. Julia, Julia, come on. Come on. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep saying tweaking, and Amanda's just Please gonna don't. <laughs> oh god. Okay. So their relationship with children is expanded uh, later in Latvian mythology uh, regarding the Laume. Uh, they're seen as assistants during a birth, ensuring the health and welfare of both the mother and the child. Nice. Um, if the mother does not survive childbirth, which is, you know, a common thing back in the day, unfortunately, um, or if they give the child up, the Lauma who is 
watching over the birth takes up the role as a spiritual foster mother for the child. Wow. Isn't that kind of gorgeous? That's like a super beautiful godparent situation. I really like that. Wow. Side note, Odd Parents, Fairly Odd Parents, underrated TV show from Nickelodeon. It was a really good one. It was a really good show. Also, Style Goals. I want a pink hat like that. (laughs) Come on. You want that uh, lesbian Timmy version? I super do. Yeah. There was a whole episode where she turns into, well, he turns into a girl and- Uh, Don't you know I remember that? I know. And all my early gender feelings were like, (laughs) ugh. I I get it now. Yeah. Okay. um, So- when Alauma is looking over a child, she spins the cloth of life for the child, which she can't control what she spins. Um, Whoa. But it's just the fate of the child lays yeah. out. Um, That's and so it's so much better than palm lines. And it's really interesting because Alauma could sew something and then like the child could die in a, you know, a fever or really yeah. young. And so Alauma will actually cry over the cloth <gasps> of the child because you know, the fate is not up to her and it's really... She's a, just the vessel. Yeah, it's a really interesting just portrayal of it. Jeez. And I think it kind of, I think of, you know, knitting and I think of, you know, if you're not paying attention, one loop goes out and it kind of ruins the entire thing. Yeah, and, man. Oh, man. And that's a really good sort of allegory for parenthood also, which is, you know, you you birth a thing into the world with your best intentions, but at a certain point, it's not up to you. Like yes. at a certain point, to a certain extent things are baked into the person, you know, or yes. like they're, they're depending on the, your sort of degree or your belief system, certain things are determined ahead of time. Um, and like at its most secular, even like their code is baked into them mm-hmm. and it, you know, how it, how it plays out is sort of a function of both nature and nurture, but that is so interesting. And also to be the vessel of that, mm-hmm. like obviously, you know, we haven't been parents yet, but like, dang, that's amazing. I, I also like that so many uh, fate deities are associated with weaving and sewing and all of that. Yeah. Like, I, I just, I love that concept so much. I love the idea of creating something and like, you know, in this case, it's beyond your control, but in the case of many other, you know, fate deities and stuff like that, um, it's very much in their control. And I just... Love the idea of sort of the scarf of destiny or whatever. Yeah, the, the yeah. portrait that will become someone's life that is being decided by something higher than them. And to but, me, like, so the beautiful thing about weaving is, you know, you, you picture a loom, mm-hmm. right? And at the top of the loom is a beautifully woven carpet. In the middle is the work that you're doing. And then at the bottom is like... 10, you know, thousands or dozens or hundreds of strings just like spooling out into the floor. And it's like, you take that chaos and you create it into order. And that to me is what life is also is just taking the like unending, uh, you know, like array of ingredients and choosing them and weaving them and molding them into one path. And so you look behind you and the scarf of your life is behind you. Mm-hmm. But you look ahead and it's just the like multitudinous sea mm-hmm. of multicolored threads that you can be following. Yeah, it reminds me of timelines, you know? Yes. Every decision we make is another splinter off of a se- like centered timeline. And so when you talk about that loom, you see all of the options of where these threads could possibly go. They're just hanging there. And it depends on where you weave, which ones come out the top, which ones stay in the bottom and aren't seen. And I like, I like weaving even more than the idea of a timeline or a path Mm -hmm. because every person's path is going to be unique. Yes. And every combination of threads that you could think of is also unique. It's not like you're following one down forever. Then it would be like just a one colored scarf and like whatever. Boring. But boring. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Who cares? But I really, really love that kind of framework for thinking of, you know, you with your decisions every single day knit the the scarf of your destiny, which mm-hmm. is only really visible and legible in retrospect. And And looking ahead of you, all you can think is, you know, what are the ingredients I want to choose? And what it looks like is not necessarily up to you. Mm-hmm. But what you can do is is make the most informed and best decision that you can and later on reflect on what has occurred. I the like business that. of weaving, the business of knotting, the like, you know, kinetic, interesting, perilous work of turning your inputs into into your past is not really up to you. All you can do is make choices and, and keep going. That was a really good you know, sidestep to the I'm story. I'm three whiskeys in and I am trying really hard. You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you so much. And everyone's noticing. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, um, we're going to finish out the story and then we can dive into a little bit more conversation. Let's do it. As Christianity spreads through this region, the role of the Lao Mei obviously becomes more downplayed and the images of the goddesses eventually deteriorates. Right. They were soon accused of being baby snatchers, mostly by men, lots of priests, you know, that yeah, kind of thing, yeah. who were said to steal children because they couldn't have children of their own. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. What I know. a... We'll, we'll get there in a second. A thing. Okay. Um, so their looks and sweetness were taken away with these retellings, um, and they were viewed instead as evil old hags. Wow. And the Lao Mei become a melancholy character that longs for her beauty of her youth from then on. Wow. And oh my God, Amanda, this ending makes me so mad. Tell me all about it, babe. Because I just, I feel like this is the same instance we've seen so many times with a goddess or a spirit that embodies something very feminine, womanly, and beautiful. Uh, But then because she's lacking this one thing that society considers womanly, the ability to bear children in this case, she's turned into this baby snatching witch-like character. Which also happens to be the only thing that men can lay any kind of claim to to I know right of like oh you know you're unable to fulfill the one task that relates to to me as a as a you know kind of male imposing a viewpoint onto this thing uh, and like I mean to a certain extent maybe they can't help it but also that sort of like heteronormative gross kind of like putting things into boxes perspective yeah. really robs this myth of all of the things that make it incredible which is like incredible compassion for people you aren't related to exactly right? and like thinking and thinking and caring and being invested and literally using your hands to weave the future of someone that you're not necessarily supposed you know in, in air quotes or like have to care about and like what is humanity except for caring about people you don't have to care about like that's it that's the thing so she becomes defined by society for the one thing she can't do rather than all the things she does phenomenally watching out for those children weaving bringing rain that helps harvest all that kind of thing and you bring up a really good point because just it's it's so frustrating because all she's trying to do in these later stories before she's you know corrupted by christianity is she's trying to help yeah she's trying to do the best she can she's looking out for other people she's being compassionate yeah and the ironic thing is that her altruism which is you know by many definitions a christian trait right of like caring for those less fortunate and looking for those you know at a, a kind of lower station in life that is sort of like i don't know transmogrified into some kind of failed maternal instinct by the like I mean, and to a certain extent, it makes sense, right? Because, like, the unit of the family, the institution of the house, the institution of, you know, church and state and all of those things, like, that brought us out of the forest. And, like, that helped us to establish societies and to be safe. But at a certain point, like, you're safe enough that you can embrace things that are different and contradictory and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we definitely are seeing the kind of pendulum, like we we were able to identify the point at which the pendulum overswings Yes, and takes something that, you know, in this moment, in this day and age, we find so interesting that like, there's a reason us and our listeners want to listen to these stories Mm -hmm. every week. You know, we, we've gone a couple centuries too far into the, I don't know, business of like making them safe and, and hospitable. Yeah. And I just, I guess I'm just very frustrated with this story too, because it is the quintessential no good deed goes unpunished. Oh, for sure. You know what I mean? Alpha the babe. Oh God. It's just, it's, I, I can't imagine a situation that's worse than being scrutinized for the things that you are doing your best to like help the world with. You know what I mean? Yeah. It kind of comes down to, to just the idea of the internet being particularly if this person does one thing wrong then yeah. everything they they've done up until this point is terrible which we call a witch hunt which is not the worst possible allegory for no, the thing it's not. and it's not the hunting of the witches it's the fact of the witches like the yes. fact that you know fertility goddesses and pagan goddesses and and people like the Lao Mei that we have kind of pushed into this box of witch or hag or crone Mm -hmm. um you know that's like the way that we deal with errant women with women who aren't a you know a virgin maiden and potential wife or a like fertile obedient subservient mother um you know once the kind of like fertility passes then society and and myth doesn't know what to do with those Mm -hmm. women much less a young woman who doesn't engage in any of those institutions and so you know it it makes sense to me that folks on the internet who are complicated 
um, are, are kind of shoved into a box. And I had previously been kind of resistant to that term witch hunt because mm-hmm. it, it sounded, I mean, it's, it's an extreme term, right? Yes. And like, it, it sounds like it's shutting down dialogue, but just digging into the, the ways in which that's mapped against what we're dealing with now, there's actually relevance there that I didn't expect. Yeah. And I think, I think you segued very nicely into the concept of identity, yeah. which is a really important part for the Laume because we're talking about someone who started as non-human. These, these goddesses were literally mares and dogs and stuff like that beforehand. And as they become more worshipped, as human beings can sort of identify more with them, they become more human and then very human and then beautiful, the ideal human. Yeah. And then when they become obsolete or when they become, you know, too complicated for humans to deal with, we shove them off to the side by saying, oh, these are hags. These are children snatchers. We, we don't want them, them in your lives. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's a really interesting arc. I like that a lot. Yeah. And I just, the Laume is just such an interesting concept. You know, these are, these are creatures that I, I just, I, I identify a lot with the story yeah, quite yeah. a bit because I think everyone has been in a situation where they're, they've only been trying their best and to be their own person. And then they've been victimized for that. You know what I mean? I'm just frustrated. I'm very frustrated with the story. I love it. It's a great story, but I'm very frustrated. And it it. also brings up the fact that so many of the stories and the myths that we tell, um, you know, the people are archetypes and Mm -hmm. like, that's, that's what stories are, you know, is, is like a, an artificial or a representative, um, you know, small thing, a small story, um, that you tell in order to teach a lesson or to think about a concept or to, you know, put a scary thing like death or destruction or loss or betrayal into a form that your brain can hold at one time. And that doesn't really lend itself well to the idea of human beings as complex, changeable people with, um, conflicting needs and desires and goals and a long life in which you can play many parts. Um, and I think that the risk is listening to any one story as gospel. And the beautiful thing now about, you know, the, the world that we're living in is like, there are so many stories at our disposal. There are so many cultures and mythologies that we can learn from, think about, talk critically about yeah. and see ourselves in. And there are endless things on Netflix, endless books out there, you know, endless music albums that we can listen to and see different parts of ourselves. You don't have to just choose the one that stands for our whole self. And that's, I think, a plus of the modern age, you know, and, and the world that we're living in. Um, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a very, very dangerous thing to ascribe one narrative to a person or, um, or, or to do that for yourself because anything that villainizes change Mm -hmm. and anything that makes a person, anything that puts a person on blast for doing something different or trying on a new identity, that's just a dangerous thing to me. Yeah. Our myths need elasticity or they need to be taken in as part of a, a balanced diet of myths, sure. you know? And so that's why I love this myth so much is because we do trace that whole arc of going from a, you know, unknown and kind of, uh, feared demon esque, mm-hmm. uh, figure to one that represents the primordial forces that we're still a little bit nervous about. Like we talked last week about how childbirth is like the most, instinctual animalistic like we are creatures that come from somewhere else type Mm -hmm. act um and so of course there's gonna be a goddess associated with that a little bit too wild into something that's like desirable maiden shaped you know that that you can lust after and think about um you know dominating or holding or or you know trapping in an institution um and then finally to something that is so out of our control that we have to kind of push it in a box and lock it up in a in a hut you know and Mm -hmm. and leave it there to be scary and i think your favorite walt whitman quote definitely applies here we contain multitudes we do we contain multitudes and i think that the laume creates a very interesting and very almost cautionary tale for us we we can be all of these things but we shouldn't allow people to put us in these boxes and you know vilify us just because we are different than what they expect and furthermore i think we should be alert in our own selves of the boxes we put other people into that's true um where you know our our brains 
evolutionarily are really good at patterns yes. and we're really good at putting things into boxes and we're really good at assessing something complex or something very, very quickly and putting it into boxes we can understand. And that helps us, you know, that helps us to distinguish threat from friend, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and whatever, uh, and that helps us to distinguish friend from foe and threat from opportunity. But it's also something that we have to like actively resist every single day yeah. is thinking like that is the maiden, that is the hag, you know, that is the demon, mm-hmm. um, that is a romantic object that is not. Yeah. And, and to realize that like, you know, if we're lucky, we're going to fill so many of those things over the course of our lives mm-hmm. and understanding that every single person is at a different point in their own journey and they have contained multitudes and they do contain multitudes and their future contains multitudes that their scarf can go anywhere and has come from so many choices. And like every person is just meeting one another at a different stage in their journey. That just like that perspective has at least personally, like that's changed my whole life. And that's at the, the direction of my adult life. Mm-hmm is just choosing to approach the world with that perspective. Right. And just understanding that everyone else has that perspective too. Everyone else is an individual person that has individual thoughts and an individual past that has put them into this situation, into this place right now. Both of us are members of the Nerdfighter community. And uh, I remember we were in Florida, I think one year in 2008, maybe? Yeah. 2009. um, And we binged Brotherhood 2.0, which was a web series um, by John and Hank Green. And at you know, it was, it was formative for me for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. And we now work with them to do our merch. And that's like a very incredible, like life circle thing. Yeah. But but that story that John tells about his wife. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and how they met and and how they kind of think and talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but another sort of thing that that taught me was imagining other people complexly. Yes. And that's a a term that John talks about a lot. Their companies now call complexly. Like it's, it's important to them for a reason. Um, and that was the first time in that YouTube video that I sort of saw the thought, um, really put out there at, you know, whatever I was 15 or 16, um, that other people are the center of their own universes. Yeah. And I was like, Oh Jesus, like, Oh, like I had never considered that before like, or it oh, had never been told to me. Everyone or, else is the main character in their own story. What exactly. the fuck? Like, how, Oh God, that makes so much more sense yeah. now. And so then it makes it easy to say that the person who cut me off in traffic has somewhere they really need to be. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, just going to that place in my head instead of the, oh, this person is an ob- is an obstacle or an antagonist or a subplot or a side quest in my own life. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't help but approach life as the protagonist of my own story. Yes. But what I can do is remember and to force myself to reckon with the fact that every single other person is also the protagonist of theirs. Yeah. And that, that's not only like a nice thing, like it's, it, it's nice to do, it's altruistic, whatever, but it also makes my life easier. Like it's, it's just easier to talk to people and to live in the world and to, to spend less energy on stuff that you can't control. If you realize that every single person is doing their best for themselves and hopefully for their view of the world and what it needs. And when we can align those values, awesome. When I can help someone else out, great. Like if I can be a really great and lucky like mystery box that they stumbled upon in their day Mm -hmm. you know that's that's what i want to be i like that quite a lot yeah stay creepy stay cool Spirits was created by Julia Shafini and me, Amanda McLaughlin. It's edited by Eric Schneider with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Subscribe to Spirits on your preferred podcast app to make sure you never miss an episode. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr at Spirits Podcast. On our Patreon page, patreon.com slash spirits podcast, you can sign up for exclusive content like behind the scenes photos, audio extras, director's commentary, blooper reels, and beautiful recipe cards with custom drink and snack pairings. If you like the show, please share with your friends and leave us a review on iTunes. It really does help. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.